Isn't this exhibit A why Olympic ratings are so low this year? The focus on woke and not the win? Woke. Once everyone's all woke, woke it'll is, be great. Woke is a dangerous <laughs> word to use. Sometimes people can be so woke, though. Everybody in the end gets cancelled. Yeah. Well, as I, I always say, you know, I mean, good luck to the woke karate when ch the Chinese Communist Party takes over. They're going to have a great time. You know, this, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff, I, you should get over that quickly. The world, the world is messy. Wokeism. What is it? A force for good? For bad? The woke ultras who want to wipe away all symbols of British imperialism don't speak for the families who lived under the empire. Political correctness gone mad. You can always count on a cabbie to say it how it is. And when it comes to political correctness, this lot certainly have a view. As far as today's thing is concerned, you know, I'm a dinosaur. Is it really everywhere? Coca-Cola going all woke. Is it a red herring? A new McCarthyism? I invited them to give information of wrongdoing, graft, corruption, communism. I am continuing to get to that information. Getting documents too? Yes. The idea of being woke, of wokeism, appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Does it have a history? What's going on under the surface when you strip away the noise? We'll look at the history of the term, how it's related to political correctness, ask whether it goes back even further, before thinking about what I'll describe as the broadening of the public sphere, its relationship to fashion, and the council culture debate. Let's just get stuck in. The problem with any analysis of a term like woke is that it's vague, already outdated, contested, and means different things to different people. What I want to try and show here is that it's best understood not as a concept, but as a logic or a process. Its original meaning, staying alert to injustice, has been reinterpreted by reactionaries to ironically describe the misguided, the censorious, and the dogmatic. But if it's just a label, how does it become an ism, a culture, a movement? To many, wokeism is equivalent to council culture, while many who are labelled as woke would reject the term entirely, or at least never use it themselves anymore. Of course, the idea of being awake to something is a vague notion, but in the early 20th century, this idea of being awake became associated with philosophical ideas about self-consciousness and identity, especially for black Americans and the colonised. The black nationalist Marcus Garvey urged the oppressed colonies to wake up Ethiopia, wake up Africa, and argued that descendants of slaves in the US could only achieve political consciousness through separation, independence, and an exodus back to Africa. You can enslave what was done for 300 years the bodies of men, you can shackle the hands of men, you can shackle the feet of men, you can imprison the bodies of men, but you cannot shackle or imprison the minds of men. Sociologist and precursor to the civil rights movement, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote about a black double consciousness and a life within the veil. He wrote, One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this striving, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In 1938, the American musician Lead Belly wrote a protest song about nine black teenagers accused of rape. At the end, Lead Belly says, And uh, you know, he showed me the Scottsboro Boys, and I shake hands with him, so I made this little song about down there. So I, I advise everybody to be a little careful when they go along through that, but stay woke, keep their eyes open. And the 
first writer to use the term in print was probably William Melvin Kelly, who argued that beatniks had appropriated black woke slang. He wrote that the American Negro feels he can, on the spur of the moment, create the most exciting language that exists in any English-speaking country today. I asked someone how they felt about white people trying to use hip language. He said, man, they blew the gig just by being grey. Barry Beckham's 1972 play Garvey Lives contains the lines, No, I won't go to sleep, I won't, I've been sleeping all my life, and now that Mr Garvey done wake me up, I'm gonna stay woke. And in the middle of the 20th century, the psychiatrist and philosopher Franz Fanon wrote extensively about black and colonised consciousness and identity. For most of the 20th century though, it was a marginal word. It only gained wider currency in the outrage over the shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer in 2014. It was quickly adopted by Black Lives Matter's protesters as a reminder to be aware of police injustice. At its simplest then, the term woke has been used to encourage political awareness of injustice, to wake up to social issues that are otherwise and previously hidden, especially with regards to racial justice. But the term was quickly co-opted by the right and turned into a term of derision. The woke karate, the woke mob, and cancel culture were, in the eyes of many, a loud, misguided movement determined to silence their ideological enemies. At that moment, the way woke was used slipped neatly into another lineage. Political correctness. We are being enveloped with political correct nonsense. You know, what is so worrisome about this new brand of censorship is it doesn't care if something is actually offensive. 68% of Aussies believe that we are now a country that's far too politically correct. In his History of the Concept, historian Geoffrey Hughes has defined political correctness as a slightly puritanical intervention to sanitise the language by suppressing some of its uglier prejudicial features. It's striking, when you look into it, how similar the political correctness and woke debates have been. Let's look at some definitions. A 1992 article in The Scotsman, for example, remarked that a survey of children's authors by the writers group Penn suggests that publishers are not content merely with encouraging writers to be politically correct, but are actually censoring anything they feel to be politically incorrect. In 1997, the Oxford English Dictionary described PC as conformity to a body of liberal or radical opinion on social matters, characterised by the advocacy of approved views and the rejection of language and behaviour considered discriminatory or offensive. Webster's College Dictionary defined it earlier in 1991 as marked by or adhering to a typically progressive orthodoxy on issues involving especially race, gender, sexual affinity or ecology. In the 90s, feminists were already arguing that words like chairman or businessman should be replaced with chairperson and businessperson. To its advocates, being politically correct was about reappropriating the labels that were often used to designate outsiders, the colonised, minorities, foreigners, to strip terms of their prejudice and reformulate them with more neutral language. But where did this come from? It was on this campus <clears throat> that a group of students decided that because they disagreed with Nabed piece published in the student newspaper, they would strike out for political correctness by simply confiscating and destroying an entire issue of the paper. Well, many saw it as a monster, invented by the right, conjured up to discredit progressives. But while it was certainly exaggerated by the right, the fight over language was very real. Author, filmmaker and activist Tony Cade Bambara wrote in 1970s The Black Woman, for example, that a man cannot be politically correct and a chauvinist too. Facts on File in 1975 wrote that on the lesbian issue, she said that the National Organisation of Women was moving in the intellectually and politically correct direction. 
between the 70s and the 90s, the debate had moved into the mainstream in the US and the UK. So what was significant about that moment? Well, two things happened. Some saw it as language that had emerged from Mao's cultural revolution. Mao wrote that the failure of the party's leading bodies to wage a concerted and determined struggle against these incorrect ideas and to educate the members in the party's correct line. Trotsky had also talked of a correct political perspective, and the Soviet Union quickly followed Mao's emphasis on cultural issues. At the same time, the cultural revolution and the cultural turn in humanities departments began to emphasise and study questions of culture, language and everyday life from a political perspective. The civil rights movements and second wave feminism highlighted questions of culture as much as politics. Cultural politics, the idea that both were intertwined, became central. But we could go back further. If wokeness and political correctness are about correct language, justice and injustice, progressive politics and reaction, then aren't these just timeless phenomena? As Hughes points out, what was politically correct in England before the Civil War under Charles I changed entirely under Cromwell's Commonwealth and changed again with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. What was politically incorrect under Tsarist Russia quickly changed under the Bolsheviks. What was politically incorrect in colonial America was transformed throughout the War of Independence. So if, as an underlying logic, it's nothing new, what is going on? The public sphere, according to the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, is the loose set of mediums, persons and institutions through which public affairs are discussed and decided. Under a monarchy and throughout the Middle Ages, the public sphere was limited to the king or queen's court. With the development of the printing press and increasingly throughout the Enlightenment, this sphere widened to include philosophers, businessmen and newspapers. This, of course, required money and a certain social position. However, Habermas argued, the Enlightenment public sphere was dynamic, a proliferation of coffee houses, clubs, masons lodges, publications, letters and books all contributed to the discussion of politics and new ideas. In the year of the French Revolution in Paris, every political or politically minded man of any worth started a club or a journal. In May of 1789, as many as 450 clubs and 200 journals sprang up across Paris. Compared with today though, the public sphere was still compromised of a tiny minority of privileged metropolitan elites. And while this continued throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, more people entered the debates through the sale of cheap newspapers, social mobility, entry into universities, and the development of the radio, the television, and the internet. In the late 20th century especially, there was a rapid and exponential deepening and broadening of the public sphere not only through these new media technologies, but through globalisation and multiculturalism. But capital and corporations, legacy media and big money still dominated. Media theorists call old technology like radio and television one-to-many mediums, one person broadcasting out to many others, while the internet can be one-to-many, many-to-one and many-to-many. We can roughly map the first wave of political correctness onto moments like the Cultural Revolution, women's and civil rights movements, and globalisation leading to multiculturalism. This brought many more, whether as participants or simply as topics, into the discussion. But many others, of course, were still marginalised. This second wave, wokeism, is an internet phenomenon. Today, information, to a large degree, has been democratised. Anyone can educate themselves on any topic, 
and footage of injustice from police shootings and concentration camps can be transmitted around the globe in seconds. But this digital ecosystem has created new pressures, and there's one that's particularly human. The demand that we know, that we're in the loop that we're up to date with the news, with history, with music, with trends, with fashion. We're a gossiping species, a social species, and we're judged on how well we play the social game. We must, above all else, be interesting. This applies to justice and morality as much as any other topic. Man, after all, is a political animal. There's a digital demand that we wake up become woke, know what's right and wrong in the world, have a viewpoint, an argument. Traditionally, these questions about politics, culture, morality and justice were monopolised by the king's court, the church, hashed out by newspapers, political parties, the New York Times, polling institutes, experts and specialists. In his 1989 classic, Bureaucracy, political scientist James Wilson writes, a professional is someone who receives important occupational rewards from a reference group whose membership is limited to people who have undergone specialised formal education and have accepted a group-defined code of proper conduct. The group sets the standards, defines what's correct, what's the right way of talking about things, and often has vested interests. But when it comes to politics and justice and morality, that specialised formal education and group-defined code of proper conduct has always been a type of chimera. Politics and justice affects everyone. Each person and every community has a perspective and a contribution to make. This was the basic premise of the democratic reforms of the past 200 years. We can now all in varying degrees, contribute to the public sphere, have a say on Twitter, start a blog, a podcast, or a YouTube channel. We can see this broadening of the public sphere in a surprising place. Fashion magazines, as this recent Vogue cover story of Malala shows, the young woman shot by the Taliban for going to school, fashion magazines have become increasingly politicised recently. Women's magazines have featured the likes of Kamala Harris, AOC, and Jess Phillips here in the UK. Teen Vogue has attracted right-wing fury for tweeting things like, can't end poverty without ending capitalism. Candace Owens has had a meltdown over Harry Styles wearing a dress on the cover of Vogue, complaining that we should bring back manly men and that this was part of a bigger plan to take down the West. Douglas Murray has rallied against woke GQ. What connects all of this is that there's a systemic relationship between fashion, or taste, and politics. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu knew this. He saw that tastes, fashions and trends were a type of currency, what he called cultural capital. Displaying the right tastes, being in the know, demonstrating that you have knowledge of the rules of the game, contributes to your reputation, your standing. Talking about what was on TV last night, popular music, the latest novel or fashion trends, or in more elite circles, highbrow art and opera, signifies that you're a certain type of person, reliable, knowledgeable, has the right skills. An elite Victorian gentleman in an expensive, fashionable suit can immediately demonstrate that he's of value, could be taken seriously, is of worth to another Victorian gentleman and his time. Capital and knowledge, whether cultural, social or economic, is power. And knowledge about morality and justice function in the same way. The correct sort of views, the right morals, a virtuous mentality are all more likely to get you accepted in certain circles. And of course, what's considered correct changes from circle to circle, group to group, person to person.
Why is it that multinationals, magazines and brands seem to be more comfortable making moral statements about the environment, about gender roles, class, minority rights? Well, because the public sphere has broadened, more people are informed, minorities have more of a say, more of a voice, more of a platform. Editors and publishers read the room, know what their demographic like, play to the crowd. And this broadening has brought with it an explosion of viewpoints, of niche websites, offshoots of ideological viewpoints. The public sphere has become a wild, dynamic and postmodern place. I've argued that wokeism in its new form has emerged because of the broadening of the public sphere, a demand to be in the know, and a wider democratic and popular interest in justice and morality. But many would say that this has led to something else. Outrage, cancel culture, dogmatism, witch hunts and puritanical pontificating, even totalitarianism. Let's look at three quick case studies. Hans-Georg Müller from Carefree Wandering, Alex O'Connor from Cosmic Skeptic, and Winston Marshall from Mumford & Sons. Müller has recently argued that wokeism is primarily a civil religion, a shared spiritual moral vision and ideology that has a kind of national foundational impact and has an activistic and moralistic approach to political life. So it is, I think, and others have uh, said this as well, it functions basically as a new form of religion and more specifically as a new kind of civil religion. Throughout the video, Muller takes a seemingly critical view of what he thinks wokeism is, describing diversity statements as basically an exercise in woke language, saying that wokeism today has Western society in its grip, and repeatedly arguing that its basis is being unapologetically me, whatever that means. Muller's fallen into the trap of equating wokeism with religion, a shallow and ahistorical analysis that can't account for the fact that debates about moral dogmatism and political correctness in different guises are as old as time. Take a look, for example, at this definition comparing ideology to religion by philosopher Karl Lowenstein from 1969. It's characteristic of the religious that it does not admit degrees of acceptance. Being absolute by nature, it must either be accepted or rejected. There are only believers and heretics. Most modern political ideologies have become religion affected in the sense that a particular thought and belief pattern embodies values that are considered absolute by its adherents. Muller's analysis makes many bizarre claims that wokeism is individualistic, not postmodern, and is the new meta-narrative of our time. But the underlying case he makes, that wokeism is a type of dogmatic religion essentially, is a common one. In a recent Oxford Union debate, Alex O'Connor from Cosmic Skeptic makes a similar argument that cancel culture is a new and distinct and disproportionate cultural phenomenon. He says, Then what you're advocating for becomes a machine for disproportionate and arbitrary punishment, which is beyond ethically irresponsible. Disproportionate and arbitrary punishment is the behavior of despots, not of morally serious thinking beings. It's one of the first things that any functioning system of moral or legal justice must ensure cannot materialize. And it's the one thing that cancel culture does best. Once it starts, it doesn't stop. And in the same debate, this guy compares being cancelled with Gandhi and Martin Luther King being murdered. Caesar, Gandhi, JFK were all cancelled. Joan of Arc was cancelled for becoming a symbol. And 17-year-old Lady Jane Grey was cancelled for getting in the way, in the way of the throne of England, off with her head. Religions have cancelled people. Remember the Crusades? They speak for God. They are right because they have faith. I'm offended, I'm hurt. Your words pierce my heart like a knife. Words are violence, silence is violence. You're erasing my existence. 
These are the cries of people who never emotionally moved on from the nursery. And finally, Winston Marshall stepped down from Mumford & Sons after causing a Twitter backlash for tweeting that the right-wing journalist Andy No was brave for reporting on left-wing violence in Portland. OK, so what's going on? In all of these cases, the emphasis, focus and direction of empathy is on the so-called cancelled, usually but not always, admittedly, an elite or privileged person in some way, someone with a platform, while their ire is directed at the mob, the crowd, at public opinion and ordinary everyday people. In other words, they make the cardinal error of punching down, not up. As Tom Nicholas has argued in his video on council culture, the mob is often viewed and analysed through the eyes of an anxious elite. Marshall, rich, famous and from a very well-connected family, stepped down from Mumford & Sons voluntarily and found instant employment in a new career writing and talking about his cancellation on Unheard, who his father finances, and the circuit of right-wing and liberal shows, podcasts and channels that criticise cancel culture. And the irony with most of these cancellings is that I personally never heard of them until they were cancelled, and now they're everywhere. The broadening of the public sphere has meant that if you're a public figure, commentator or writer, as each of these are, who has a platform and an audience, you no longer have that platform to yourself. As Clay Shirky wrote in the aptly titled Here Comes Everybody, the more ideas there are in circulation, the more ideas there are for any individual to disagree with, more media always means more arguing. The result is simple and inevitable. More than ever, wading into the public sphere and making a public argument, especially on a controversial topic that affects people's lives, takes an extra layer of courage and an even thicker skin. And that's great. It should encourage stronger arguments. You better have your points in order if you're going to make a public case to a passionate crowd on a controversial issue. You should expect pushback. You should know you're going to face fire, invoke emotion of some kind. That's courage. Courage isn't whining, moaning and protesting that things didn't go your way. Courage isn't comparing an organisation not wanting to associate with you with being burned at the stake or sent to the gulag. The risk of rejection, the possibility of causing offence, is the price of admission to be able to broadcast your own opinions onto a stage of millions in a broadened, lively public sphere. It's a brave thing to do, admittedly, but we seem to be creating a culture where freedom of speech is becoming synonymous with freedom from consequence. The universe of public opinion is an unpredictably passionate storm. You're gonna get wet, be tossed about a bit, you might even get struck by lightning. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, they're public stages. You've willingly built an audience for yourself, and the audience has fruit. Piers Morgan can no longer stand on a platform high above the crowd, but instead has to engage with an audience. It takes an impressive display of insecurity to moan daily from a platform you willingly use about ordinary people responding to you. There's something particularly nauseating to me about directing your complaints and criticisms downwards towards ordinary people, rather than upwards to those in positions of power. Now, are there cases when people will be unjustifiably vilified? Of course. Is faux outrage real? Yes. Should we strive to be tolerant, open-minded and as undogmatic as possible? Absolutely. But this has always been the case. Dynamic political discussion about morality, justice and the limits of our freedoms is what democracy is about. We live in a period of history where speech has never been freer. You have never been freer to make a point without repercussions. This is the most tolerant period in history. Gulags and concentration camps are rare. Monarchs are powerless. The Politburo is defunct. The church has dismantled its stakes and almost anything 
can be published. The public sphere is a rich, vibrant and broad place. Ian Forster couldn't publish his gay novel Maurice until 1971, despite it being written in 1910. Newspapers were censored right up to the Vietnam War. In France, women couldn't have a bank account in their own name until 1965. Publishing houses, magazines and newspapers have always had strict guidelines and editorial codes. Again, we live in the freest speech period in history. The public sphere is broad and varied. Expect pushback. Have courage. Punch up, not down. Stay awake to injustice and be kind. What is wokeism? Nothing. It's dead. As usual, thank you so much to these people. This little argument just wouldn't be possible without them. If you'd like to support me make more videos like this, uh, you can do so through the link below. There's a Discord server where I put the videos out early. I make the scripts available early to patrons and you get your name in the credits and you get to support a little independent creator like me. If not, hit like, subscribe, share the bell and I'll see you next time.